We know from economics, psychology, and political science that people are notoriously bad at risk assessment and threat perception. For instance, we tend to overweight probabilities of events that are more vivid, more easily imagined, or more easily recalled from memory, and underweight probabilities of those that are longer term and abstract. The greatest threats Americans feel they face are not always the greatest threats they actually face. So what are the national security threats average Americans don't spend enough time worrying about, and what is the role of the government to reduce fear, no matter what the reason for it? Joining me today is Lisa Monaco, former assistant to President Obama for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, former assistant attorney general for national security, a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center, and a distinguished senior fellow at NYU Law. Lisa, pleasure to have you here. Great to be here. All right, so let me, let's step back for a second. How does one get involved in this business in the first place? As a kid, you know, were you the one uh, who just loved working in windowless rooms <laughs> and, you know, called the kitchen the situation room? Yeah, no, hardly. Um, I got into this because about, I guess now, over a decade ago, uh, I was working with uh, then a little-known Washington lawyer named Bob Mueller <laughs> as his chief of staff at the FBI. Um, and it was at a time in the FBI where it was transforming itself after 9-11 uh, to become a national security organization, uh, meaning uh, the FBI had, for its 100-year history, been focusing on pro investigating and prosecuting crimes after they happen, so basically looking at some, an incident that happens after the fact. And after 9-11, it had to reorient itself to be a national security organization focusing on the latest intelligence, the latest threats to prevent the next uh, terrorism attack. So I got very involved in the national security focus of, um, of the FBI, and then everything followed from there. And from there? So in the economics, there's this, there's this idea of states of the world. One is, uh, is risk, another is uncertainty, another one's ignorance. And in risk, in risky states of the world, we have, we have known states of the world but, and known probabilities mm -hmm. of what, you know, what's likely to happen or what's not unlikely to happen. Uncertainty is known states of the world and uh, un unknown probabilities. And ignorance is unknown states of the world and unknown probabilities. Mm -hmm. In national security, which, which one are we living in? So I think your, your lay down at the beginning um, really summed it up quite accurately. In other words, um, we have a perception of threats that sometimes don't match the likelihood uh, they have to occur. But in some sense, um, it, when you're in the national security business and when you're focused on preventing the next attack, on protecting the country, I think you also have to focus on what those perceptions are. You have to be driven by intelligence, you have to be driven by the threat, but I think in part of homeland security, and something I used to say when I was working in the White House, part of security is letting people know what you're doing to keep them safe, even if their perception of the threat is not realistic or not based in fact, they won't um, believe that you are doing what you can to keep them safe if you don't kind of speak to them where they are. Right. And fear creates its own instability in society. And just because you can rationally say, well, I'm not likely to, you know, for lightning to strike me or whatever, right. or this terrorist threat to happen. But fear also has its own negative consequences. It and does. so, is there, is there, how did, were you, yeah, were you, did you feel like you were a psychologist <laughs> at certain times? I mean, seriously, because you have to think about human behavior and threat assessment and, and inflation and deflation of threats. Yeah. Well, look, I, the, the, the statistic that gets a lot of airtime is that more people die in their bathtub than um, are likely to be killed in a terrorist attack. But I think to a certain extent, if people perceive their surroundings to be unsafe, to, if they uh, are worried uh, for their children, they may engage in behaviors that um, are going to be counterproductive, right? So part of the job is to understand what that threat, uh, what that fear is about, uh, and to respond to it, but to respond to it with facts. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing I found. You've got to arm people with information about what you and the government are doing to address their concerns about whatever the threat is, make very clear what the government is doing, what information it has, uh, and that way you can build some trust with, about what the government is doing to keep them safe. Now, in a post-fact world, though, <laughs> does that present a little wrinkle? I think it can, um, but I think we all have to do our part to make sure we are operating from a fact base, right? So one example is, uh, folks remember about four years ago, we were seized with a fear of Ebola. 
right? There was an epidemic raging in West Africa, and people were very concerned that that epidemic would find its way here. Uh, now, one individual died in Texas from Ebola. A number of other nurses and others got sick, but they um, were, uh, you know, uh, the, they were treated and uh, turned out to be fine. But nevertheless, there was a fear, a fever yeah. uh, that took hold uh, about the likelihood of being infected. Yeah. When the facts are, and we had to make sure that we got those out early and often, the facts were that it was very, very hard to contract mm -hmm. Ebola, uh, and it, it was not, uh, you know, airborne. Uh, so very difficult to contract the disease, but the fear was outsized. Mm -hmm. Do you, now you were known, you were called by President Obama, uh, Dr. Doom. I was. Which, that doesn't feel very nice to me. Yeah, well, um, think of it from his perspective, which was uh, the reason I got uh, that nickname is because basically every time I saw him, which was yeah. every day, so multiple nice. times, yeah. a, thank you, <laughs> multiple times a day, I invariably was telling him something, giving him some form of bad news. My portfolio, my set of responsibilities in the White House included, as the name implies, as my title implies, homeland security and counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was everything from natural disasters um, to terrorist attacks, both uh, here at home and abroad, where U.S. citizens uh, might come into harm's way abroad, to cyber threats, to pandemic uh, preparedness and response. So that whole panoply of uh, concerns to active shooters, to basically anything bad uh, that happened here at home, I was uh, talking to the president about. So uh, I didn't bring him much good news. How often, how many times did you have to wake him up in the middle of the night? So I didn't have to wake him up that often, but um, mostly because he is a uh, he noted, <laughs> he didn't sleep very much, he's a noted night owl. Mm -hmm. So I could, uh, you know, reach out to him one or two in the morning and he would still be up. Um, so he was, he was definitely a night owl. He would read late into the night to prepare for his meetings the next day. We would give him a very thick briefing book every, every night when um, he went uh, home uh, to have dinner with his family and then prepare for the next day. But the, the one time I do remember having to wake him up was my third week on the job. And third week in the White House. Third week in the White House. Uh, and it was the week of the Boston Marathon bombing. And uh, folks will recall that by the end of that week, the manhunt uh, had reached a crescendo, and there was, of course, the shootout in uh, Cambridge. Yeah. It was a lockdown. Right. Um, and uh, that very, very early that Friday morning at the end of that week, when one of the Boston bombers uh, had died in this shootout and the other one was on the run, um, I had been talking to the FBI director, Director Mueller at the time, getting all the updates, and it was about 3.30 in the morning, and I decided I needed to wake up the president mm. to tell him that one of the Boston bombers was on how the do, run. How do you even start a phone call like that? Well, you know, actually, it's interesting. People say, boy, was that tough, and, yeah. you know, that must have been hard. It actually was an easy decision for me to make, yeah. that I had to wake him up, and the reason is because it was very clearly a public safety issue. Mm. We had concerns that there may have been uh, other accomplices, um, and we didn't know quite what we were dealing with, and that was presented a public safety issue, and it was clear uh, and an easy call for me to know that he would want to know, and, and I had to wake him up. Um, he was gracious about it. Yeah, he was okay. He yeah. didn't, he didn't uh, criticize you for it. A little grumpy. He was, <laughs> he was okay. Um, now, when you're in, in these intense situations, and, and as, as an advisor for Homeland Security, you got to worry about the biggest threats yeah. that Americans face, and you have to be, you know, so on top of top of them. What do you use to relax or unwind? You know, <laughs> what it, what are the things that you come home to, so to speak? Soap operas? Are they like <laughs> rom coms? Are they what what just kind of comedies? What are the things that you surround yourself with? So. Look, I think uh, exercise has always been, okay. um, you know, a stress relief. Um, trying to get uh, enough sleep, which I was not successful at when yeah. I was working in the White House, because I would get woken up by the Situation Room, um, you know, at least once a week really? with some report of something happening in the world. Because, uh, of course, the Situation Room, folks don't know, is not one room. It is a network of rooms in the White House, and it is staffed 24-7 
by an incredible group of uh, military and intelligence community uh, members who are there working around the clock, receiving information from all around the world about what's happening, from our embassies, from the intelligence community, just having their finger on the pulse literally about what's happening all over the world. And uh, I would invariably, as with the National Security Advisor, get woken up about, you know, North Korea launches a right. missile, um, our embassy may be under threat. And so that type of rhythm was constant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you never really could be off. Yeah. I never was, uh, could kind of completely relax because something was always happening and I w would uh, be notified of it. And then immediately the questions I would ask myself, um, what does the president need to know? Uh, what advice should I be giving him so that he can make the decisions he needs mm -hmm. to make? What is the government doing? Is it organized properly to respond to whatever this threat is? Yeah, so most people do think the Situation Room is the, though that iconic photograph from uh, the 2011 uh, Osama bin Laden raid yep. in Abbottabad. Uh, we think of that little tiny room as the sit room. That's actually the mini room. That's the mini room. Yep. So there's a, there's a there's mega a room. There's a bigger version of that, yeah. about two or three times the size of that Why room. Why they just use that one? Everyone was crowded in that little space. So, they should have they found some more. So the story behind that is, in fact, they were in the bigger room um, meeting and um, had been throughout the weekend to discuss um, the, the upcoming raid and planning it. And that's where the major, that's where the National Security Council meets, that's where the principals and the deputies committee of the National Security Council would meet. But this side room, the smaller version, is where um, a member of the military was, uh, had the live video feed of the raid as it was happening. So he was there monitoring and um, when the president, when President Obama learned that there was a live video feed in the next room, he said, I wanna go in and see. And so then everyone followed Oof. to see what was happening. And of course happening. Your, your predecessor was there, John Brennan, John Brennan who then yep. became director of the CIA. Yep. How prominently, um, because we're in snack break, and I'm curious to know how prominently Goldfish actually <laughs> featured in your White House career because it was a great choice. Yes. Very excited about it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I was never successful in getting it put on the, the mess menu. So the White House mess <laughs> right. is um, the dining facility that is available to uh, folks who work in the West Wing. And uh, we're very, very fortunate. We were very fortunate, those of us who worked in the West Wing, and spent you know, 16, 18 hours a day in uh, this very small space. And uh, we never had to go outside uh, to get a meal because um, the, the White House uh, dining staff um, would uh, had a facility mm -hmm. there, so we were very fortunate, and th those folks worked uh, also, it seemed, around the clock. Yeah, but okay. I never was successful in getting goldfish on, yeah. the, on the mess well, menu. Well, we can fix that uh, and you. resolve all those inequities with the White House Dining Services. That's great. Uh, and now we you. can do a little advertisement yeah, for we, Pepper's <laughs> Farm. Pepper's Farm, yeah. Exactly. I wonder how many Twitter followers they have. <laughs> um, so, I'm very happy that you got the original. Right. So, right. So this is what I grew up with. I yeah. used to go and sneak into the pantry uh, and just shovel this down my throat yep. secretly and ruin my appetite. You know, I was ne never able That's to have a danger. full dinner. That is yep. the danger. These things are delicious. They're terrific, actually. Because so, goldfish remind you of, a, of, a, of your childhood, of an era in your life? I've just always really loved them. Yeah. Um, I think cheddar, now I have to say, and with all due respect to those who like the other versions, the you know the pizza version, yeah. the jalapeno version. <laughs> yeah. I've always been a bit of a purist, so I like the straight up original cheddar oh, it's recipe. The best. Yeah. Um, they're you know bite size, and you can just you know the danger is of course yeah. you do end up shoveling a lot in. Yeah, they have they're filled with air basically, so you feel like oh this is not that much. It's I all can just a rationalization. Put another forty in my mouth. I just I've just always really liked them. I you know and uh, they. They, uh, some time ago, if folks notice, they have a little smile on the goldfish. So it's also. Really? Yeah, it's, it's a little. Every, oh my God. So it's, you know. I, it also brightens your day. It lo brightens <laughs> your day, yeah. Now, so this, I would get this experience you, you had in the White House and seeing all the threats and getting those calls in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Did it make you fear the world we live in more or did it make you more optimistic about the challenges that we face? So. I'll, I'll um, say both because I was privy to um, a set of information and a constant stream of intelligence which made quite clear that there are a lot of bad people out there trying to do horrible things right. um, 
to, uh, to this country, to Americans abroad. Uh, and of course, um, I was privy to intelligence that um, reflected bad things and dangerous situations all around the world um, and you know, struggles for uh, people not fortunate enough to live in this country. So uh, that could be quite depressing. Mm. But on the flip side, I also, you know, I spent 20 years in government, the majority of that before I was in the White House in law enforcement and as a career prosecutor in the Justice Department and working in the FBI. And then, of course, when I went to the White House, got a broader view of the national security community and the homeland security community. And what I saw in the course of my government career was an incredible professionalism, dedication, people working incredibly hard to keep this country safe, to do so consistent with the rule of law, which is not to say that everything has always been perfect, far yeah. from it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but our country, I think, the great thing about it is this ability to, um, to kind of self-renew. And we've seen that in response to crises uh, and where we make mistakes. Hopefully, we recognize them and we learn from them and we do better. But the thing that makes me optimistic is the incredible work and dedication of the career men and women mm -hmm. who I worked with across the government. Right. Um, and I think that that stays. What, uh, you know, on recognizing these things, as we mentioned, you fear is something that you have to work on. You have to minimize threats that are inflated by the public, but you mm -hmm. also have to be focused on the threats that the public is not themselves worried about, which is a mm -hmm. different you know, might be a different, completely different set of issues. What is the greatest threat that Americans face, and are we paying enough attention to it? So I think that there's a number of things that are not getting enough attention or are not calibrated in the right way in terms of how we're addressing them as government and how people are thinking about them. I give two examples. One is um, the threat of emerging infectious disease. Mm -hmm. And I use those three words quite specifically and deliberately. Um, you don't spend four years in the White House as the President's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor without being concerned about a bad guy doing something with a pathogen, right? right? And absolutely, um, I spent time being concerned about that. But I'm also concerned and developed, um, you know, a lot of um, a greater concern over the last several years about the threat of emerging infectious disease, naturally occurring um, uh, pathogens that would, don't require any malicious introduction mm -hmm. into this country uh, to cause a great deal of damage and, and frankly also fear. So examples of that, Ebola, mm -hmm. Zika, but most, most concerningly, a deadly flu. So I think, and you know, Bill Gates is somebody who has spoken, I think, quite compellingly about yeah. this, but I still think the issue is not getting enough attention. When you think about the thing that is most likely to kill the most people over the next 10 years in the shortest period of time, that's going to be um, a, a deadly outbreak of something we're not, not prepared And that's not even malicious, to. as you it's mentioned. Not it's not a malicious, a, natural... a new strain of flu yeah. is something that um, I think we should be very concerned about, and it's something actually we, worked on in the transition to help yeah. prepare the new team to be prepared for. Yeah, yeah. those anti-vaxxers are real dangers to society. It, it can be, right? And um, our, our ability to detect the emergence of um, a, a new strain of flu, for instance, is only as strong as our um, partners and uh, folks outside of the United States, their ability to detect uh, an emerging uh, outbreak. So that's why something we worked on very hard in the Obama administration was called the Global Health Security Agenda, mm -hmm. trying to build up the uh, capability of folks around the world, and particularly in developing countries, to detect new emerging strains of flu and other uh, deadly pathogens. And wh why aren't Americans, I mean, is it, why don't Americans care as much about this? It's, it seems like th they do care about Zika. People will not less tra will yeah. travel to uh, no um, more tropical areas uh, as much, uh, but people aren't. Yeah, people aren't freaking out about it. In fact, I think our vaccination is down this season for. for I think flu. so. I yeah. think so. But I think once a um, something like Ebola or Zika takes hold and there is attention in the moment mm -hmm. 
people get, yeah. uh, and you know, we already talked about the outsized fear of contracting Ebola, but we need to be focused before yeah. the outbreak happens. To uh, so it's already too late. It's already too late once it's once it's happened. Because we need to do right? the prep work to right. For instance, you know, you know, invest in. Um, uh, vaccine development, mm -hmm. uh, in in preparedness yeah. around the country, in uh, capacity abroad mm -hmm. to detect uh, an emerging infectious disease. Right. So all of that is preparatory work, yeah. which costs money and is not particularly sexy yeah. until right. um, something is screaming from the headlines. And even generally, kind of more just funding science and academic research. Exactly right. I imagine right. that those are sort of all kind of related. Yeah. Um, what about cyber? So cyber is the second thing I was going to mention in terms of um, how we, I think we need to calibrate mm -hmm. our, uh, our focus on this. I think a lot of people see headlines almost every day about a new breach, right? right. Um, Equifax, Anthem, uh, OPM, yeah. right? Sony, and of course, Sony, the, all of these things. I worry that we're getting kind of breach fatigue and that Preach people normalized, yeah. and normalized and people are kind of baking it into um, their sense of well that's just how life is. that's just how life is and it is a it's a danger that is only growing and it's growing exponentially for i think two, at least two reasons mm -hmm. one is the number of malicious cyber actors are growing and getting more diffuse particularly at the nation state level of course russia china iran north korea being the biggest players on this stage. Um, you have terrorists and um, criminals using cyber mm -hmm. means uh, to perpetrate their malicious activity. And you have what we call hacktivists, right? Folks who are just trying to make a political point. So the actors, the malicious actors are getting more diffuse. But the thing that's almost more concerning is the attack surface that they are operating on is widening exponentially, mm -hmm. and that's because of the Internet of Things. These are all of right. the devices that are hooked up to the so Internet. Like a smart refrigerator, smart, smart oven, refrigerator, all those things. All your, of those your garage things. door opener that also knows when you're approaching and it just... Exactly right. So. The smart home uh, devices that are just exploding, yeah. you know, the, the, um, the, the estimates are all over the place in yeah. terms of the numbers of these things. But the conservative one is that there will be 20 billion <clears throat> such devices hooked up to the internet uh, in just two years' time, in, wow. by 2020. By 2020. And that's the conservative <laughs> estimate. I don't even want to know what the liberal so estimate is. So that means that, that <laughs> every single one of those is a point of vulnerability. Right. Why? Because they're not built with security already in mind. And that's it's something I think we really need to change. We need that's to change. That's a philosophical uh, approach that's different. It, right? it can be. It's a market approach, right? Yeah. The, the, the thrust has been get new innovative products to market and then patch them after the fact. Uh, I think we've got to we've got to change we got to change our orientation. We've got to build some security in. We've got to incentivize uh, folks to do that. But is is there a positive to normalization in that? You know, if we kind of see okay, there's a there's a chance my bank gets breached, mm -hmm. but I still trust that we'll be resilient. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a good thing because you don't want there to be an erosion of trust mm -hmm. in anything. It's true. And so it feels to me that there's a tension there because you don't want complacency either, right? So trust and kind of everything, this is how life is, yeah. can lead to a complacency where you don't take these threats seriously, which is kind of the point you were making earlier about fear. If you don't have some amount of fear, then you can't actually, that, that is the sort of supply and source of right. um, inspiration to actually act and, and, and make life better. So I think faith in the fact that there will be resiliency is a good thing. Okay, and in your example of banks, the financial services industry has actually done a lot to make their systems more resilient, to have uh, backups and the like. So that's all good. But if that complacency means that you're just relying on the other guy yeah. to address the problem, I think that's a problem. I think we all, we have to do a lot more as individuals mm -hmm. to build up what we call cyber hygiene, mm -hmm. right? A um, incredibly high percentage of attacks could be stopped just by adopting some 
best practices, strong passwords, encrypting data, and better mm. cyber hygiene, learning not to click on that um, spam <laughs> right. uh, or you're phishing not win email. Yeah. You're, you're really not. Um, um, I can't believe that's still happening, but yeah. So, you know, the, the percentage of every one of the major attacks, almost 201 that we've just mm. talked about at the beginning of this, started with a phishing email. Right. And so we've phishing, got that's it, with a phishing with a PH. That's, yes, that's right. not a gold fishing. No, there's yes. nothing to do fishing, with Pepperidge Farm. We love right. you. That's right. I kind of served that up for you. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, from a phishing right. scam, right? And so we've got to train people to do right. better. I, I, I do the analogy that, you know, there was a time when uh, folks didn't get in their car and automatically put on their seatbelt. Now, I think you wouldn't, uh, you train your kids, you right. wouldn't imagine really getting into a car without putting on your seatbelt. Yeah. That was a shift in our orientation and yeah. in our culture, and I think we've got to do the same thing when it comes to cyber behavior but, online. But the difference was, is seatbelts are so easy to understand. It's this mm. thing that you can just, you can see it protecting you, you can feel it. Yeah. Technology's tougher. Um, how do yeah. we make it accessible, you know, when you say two-factor authentication? Yes. Who, yeah. I mean, most, I mean, I don't know how many people know what that means. Um, yeah. Maybe a good chunk, but certainly there's a lot of people out there who have no idea what that means. So yeah, I'm heartened you... by, I do a lot of public speaking. When I talk on this, I usually take a poll. Mm -hmm. uh, and the number of hands that go up is increasing when okay. I ask what people, if people know what two-factor authentication is. But your point is, is tremendously well taken, right? I think we have to do a lot more when it comes to public education. We need the Got Milk ad for cyber security, yeah. right, and cyber hygiene. And people just don't, are, is, it, is it because people are, they don't see the threat as much, they don't kind of feel it the way you want them to, because it is a huge threat. It's uh, a huge threat, and I think, um, you're right, they don't, they're baking it into their calculus. They're, you know, um, they're used to getting that uh, thing in the mail with the with the uh, address in the window that says, you know, you you may ha your information may have been part oh. of a security oh. breach, and nobody knows what to do with that. Right. Which you know, what does this mean for me? What do I do with that? Now, folks who have been the victim of identity theft online, and that can create incredible headache, and um, you know you get into a thicket yeah. of bureaucracy to try and um, straighten that out. Yeah. But I think, you know, people have got to um, start taking more responsibility for their behavior online yeah. to, to reduce those. Do you think it'll take something like what they call Cyber Pearl Harbor or Cyber 9-11, uh, which anyway feels to me kind of an unlikely event because it seems to undermine the strategy of cyber altogether, which is to, to not, to, to attack and then, uh, you know, a state or a group of people yeah. in a way that doesn't actually inspire a kinetic response. Um, so it, it, are the, is that something that actually is, is really, um, really a, a possibility here? So uh, it is a possibility, right, for all the reasons we've talked about in terms of the number of actors going up, the uh, attack surface expanding, the increasingly aggressive behavior by state actors in the space, Russia, of course, being tops of that list. Um, but I worry about the unseen catastrophic attack, the, uh, the, the attack that goes to the integrity of information, mm -hmm. right? Something that uh, erodes our trust in systems like, you know, uh, resolving millions of trades a day, right? Mm -hmm. if, if a cyber actor were to make you lose trust in whether your bank balance really is what it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. right? Going to the integrity of information, I think, is yeah. a, is a greater danger. Do you have a last question? Do you have a favorite emoji? <laughs> I like the goldfish. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for joining. Thanks it's for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you. Today we had Lisa Monaco, a former assistant to President Obama for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, former assistant attorney general for national security, a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center, and a distinguished senior fellow at NYU Law. To view more episodes, please visit our website at snackbreakshow.com.